We're going to start today on a more somber note, but I assure you, if you stay with me, it's going to get much, much better, okay? We good with that? Hang with me for a minute as I tell you just a couple of short stories. Uh, Nikki is in my small group. She's 22 years old and she's currently getting her master's degree in abnormal psychology. Her hope is to one day serve those with mental disorders. She's got a contagious personality and a good handle on what it means to be compassionate. Just last week at group though, a, a strong hush came over the room as she told us her story of being raped at the age of 15. Her seven years since that tragic evening has been met with many nights of pain, anguish, and screaming at God. But just a few months ago, she was asked to be the keynote speaker at an event in Joliet where she stood before 400 victims of rape and sexual assault, assuring them that this doesn't have to be the defining moment of their lives. See, I told, I told you, didn't I? We're starting somber, but it does get better. Another story is about a man named Alex who has a wife of 12 years and two children. Every week he struggled with what really matters in life, how to raise a family and how to make ends meet. His wife was baptized at community a few months ago, but Alex wouldn't ever attend church with her. She's been praying for him ever since her baptism. And eventually he came at the invitation of a next door neighbor, along with the continual prodding from his own children. Just a few weeks ago at our baptism uh, Sunday where 215 people publicly declared their love for Jesus, Alex was one of the 215 standing in the water. You see, it does get better. Okay, last story. Uh, this past month, a woman named Stephanie stood in the lobby of our church on a Monday afternoon and she was bawling her eyes out. She's a single mother of two children. She holds down two part-time jobs and yet still cannot afford to stay afloat. She can't pay rent, buy groceries, or buy her children new clothing as they continue to grow. And she just got slapped with another $200 late fee for not paying rent on time. But the tears she cried in the middle of our church lobby were tears of joy because out of nowhere, and I mean out of absolutely nowhere, someone anonymously took care of everything. Do you hear that? Anonymously, someone paid her rent, her late fees, her groceries uh, for the month, and even some new shoes for her boys. She met this generous offering, uh, offering with a bucket full of tears. You see, somber, but it does get better. And today we're starting uh, sort of somber, but I assure you, if you hang with us for a little while, it will get better. You know, the pain you're going through or the pain you're going to eventually go through doesn't have to cripple you, and it doesn't have to define you. If you've been with us the past three weeks, you know we've been walking through some pretty heavy realities of life, that life is hard, that not everything goes our way, that sometimes we seem to be in the desert for a long time. And we've called these seasons of challenged faith, you know, times when God doesn't deliver us from the struggle, but instead simply says, I'm going to be with you while you continue to struggle. And this can be challenging for us as we develop our faith in God because many of us have been taught that God is simply going to get us out of whatever we're going through. But as we've learned the past several weeks, his promise to be with us is far better than simply getting us out of whatever we're going through. In fact, where we want to land today is here. God wants to use the darkest part of your life to change both you and the world. Have you ever thought about you know, suffering in that way? I, I, it's not God that caused the suffering, but God wants to use your suffering to change both you and the world. Your tragedy, your struggle, and your pain can be leveraged for the good if you'll allow God into the darkest part of your life. Author and pastor Rick Warren says it like this, your greatest ministry will flow out of your pain, not out of your strengths or your talents, but out of the painful experiences of your life. It is your weaknesses that help other people in their need, not your strengths. Do you believe that? Do you believe your greatest impact in life will actually flow out of your pain? It doesn't seem like this is really how life ought to work, does it? But you know, as we'll see today, it is often how God does his greatest work is both in and through us. As we conclude this series, we're gonna look at a part of our pain and suffering we might not have seen before. You know, during the last few weeks, we've explored the plight of the Israelites as God led them out of slavery in Egypt and into the Promised Land. But the journey wasn't easy. It was difficult, it was long, 40 years long. 
and now they're about to enter the promised land. Moses has just passed away and God has chosen Joshua as the new leader. He gives Joshua instructions about crossing the river into their new home, the promised land, and God tells him, I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. God is coming through with his promise. The pain they endured wasn't meaningless. Their struggle built their character, and now they have in front of them the promise of God having their own homeland, a place where they were going to be blessed so they could in turn bless the world. Now, you might be thinking, okay, that was their pain and that was how God comforted them. He gave them the promised land, which is great, but what about my pain? Is there any purpose to be found inside my pain and my suffering? Well, if you have a Bible or a Bible app, I want to ask you to turn to 2 Corinthians uh, with me for just a moment. It's in the New Testament and comes just after the book of Romans. And let's take a look at what the Apostle Paul says to a group of Christ followers who were suffering persecution in their land, and we're gonna start in verse three of chapter one. It says, praise be to the Lord and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves received from God. Now let me ask you this, okay? What are you doing with your pain? Do you believe God can transform your pain and leverage it to bless others? Are you able to see any purpose inside your struggle? Or, okay, and this may seem a bit harsh for me to ask you, but are you and I, are we wasting our pain? And this is critical for us to think about because if we can if we just see the pain as pain, then all we're going to try to do is endure the pain, to get through it, hoping there's a better tomorrow, which can be exhausting and depressing. And it can wear us down even more. Okay, so let me, let me ask a question you may have never previously considered. Have you ever wondered how your pain could be used to help others? Now think about that for a moment. Your pain, your struggle, your worst day or moment in time can be used to not only transform you, but others as well. Now, you may not agree with me, okay, but can you for just a moment be open to the idea that God can use whatever it is you're currently going through for good? Whatever the circumstance, he can transform it for a better purpose. We go back to Corinthians, Paul goes on to explain, for just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same suffering we suffer. You see, when we share suffering uh, with someone else, we too will share our comfort with them. You know. I do understand that while we are going through the toughest times in our lives, it's really hard to look ahead to how God might use it in the future. But if we understand that our pain today can be a comfort for someone else tomorrow, I mean, wouldn't you let God use you to help others in their suffering? My guess is some of us understand and are on board, but I know a few others might be skeptical. I, I understand that. I'm a skeptic at heart, and it's very often, uh, very often difficult to see anything good coming out of the pain I'm going through when I'm going through it in the moment. But in an attempt to help us all begin to see how God can take the most tragic events of our lives and leverage them for something good, what I want to do is I want to share three stories with you today, okay? Three stories that have tragic, terrible beginnings, but beautiful endings. Three stories which remind us that while God may not have caused our pain, he can use it for the good. So the first story is about a woman named Annie Lobert. Now growing up, uh, she was not so different from most girls. She grew up in a small town and experienced common struggles with friends, schools, and boys. But her home was filled with turmoil. And at the age of nine, an older girl sexually abused her. As a teenager, Annie was assaulted numerous times by boys who said they loved her just to get what they wanted. Feeling unloved and abused, she struggled to find self-worth. 
Lured by the money and with a skewed fairy tale view of love, she was drawn toward the seductive whispers and open arms of the sex industry. Greed consumed her, the money an easy remedy to numb her brokenness, so she began a new life with a new name, Fallen. Settling under the lights of the glamorous uh, Las Vegas, she became one of the most sought after high class escorts, fielding calls from celebrities, musicians, politicians, and other men with endless supplies of cash. But the lights weren't that bright. All the glitters, as we know, is not gold, and it wasn't long before the dream of getting all she ever wanted became the nightmare that plunged her into the darkest time of her life. In her recently released autobiography, Lobert writes about her 16-year journey of being owned by a violent pimp who took every dollar and beat her multiple times within inches of her life. After more than a decade and a half of countless arrests, rapes, life-threatening calls, and utter loneliness, the freedom she had once sought became her prison. Then after being diagnosed with and treated for cancer, Annie eventually found herself at death's door from a drug overdose. That's when she finally surrendered to someone who truly loved her unconditionally, Jesus. You know, through, through Lobert's harrowing account in the clutches of the sex trafficking industry and the miraculous deliverance she experienced in the arms of Jesus, Annie decided to use her story to help rescue other victims through her organization, which is called Hookers for Jesus. Now, that's quite the name for a nonprofit, isn't it? Hookers for Jesus. You need to be careful if you Google, Google that later, all right? You know, but Annie started this organization because she wants to let others like herself know that God loves them and wants to save them from the depths of any pain, trauma, addiction, or abuse. And he longs to give them a new life. The pain and suffering Annie went through has enabled her now to help many other victims. You know, now I want to tell you a story about a little girl named Rachel who is preparing to celebrate her ninth birthday. Now, Rachel told her mother, Samantha, that she didn't want a party or any presents this year. She wanted people to donate to her Charity Water campaign. Charity Water is an organization dedicated to building water wells in developing countries, providing clean drinking water to people in need, cutting down on death and disease. Rachel heard that there were millions of kids in Africa without access to clean water, so she set a goal to raise $300 and got to work by spreading the word. By the time she turned nine, she had raised $280, which is pretty impressive, isn't it, for a nine-year-old girl? She didn't meet her goal, but she was proud and vowed to do better on her next birthday. But her next birthday never came. I want you to take a look at Rachel's story. Samantha Paul was supposed to be planning her daughter's birthday party. Instead, she was in Tigray, Ethiopia, pumping water from the wells built in Rachel's memory the dream her little girl never got the chance to see come true. She wouldn't believe it. it. She'd be like awestruck. Rachel Beckwith had heard there were kids in Africa that did not have clean water. So she made just one wish for her ninth birthday. No party, no big presents, just wanted to have people donate to her charity water campaign. She would give up so much and yet she was robbed of so much. Robbed of her life in a car accident just a few weeks later. The story of her birthday sacrifice quickly spread. Rachel's cause eventually raised nearly $1.3 million, enough to build wells in 149 communities in Ethiopia, places where children used to walk for hours to collect water, water often filled with leeches, dirt, and disease. A year after losing Rachel, Samantha visited the new wells. She tasted the water and met the families touched by her daughter's dream. I always knew that she was special. It's amazing that now other people can feel how special she was. And Rachel was everywhere, smiling on a marble plaque in a park, adorning an altar at a church. Everybody in the countryside knew about this nine-year-old girl from, you know, from Seattle, Washington, that cared about them. The villagers sang of Rachel, prayed for Rachel. One mother told Samantha she had a daughter of her own. She was telling her Rachel's story to teach the true meaning of compassion. I really miss Rachel, and I wish that, I wish that she could still be here, especially to see all the kids and the people that are going to benefit from her wish. All the children who will grow up in Ethiopia drinking clean water, thanks to a little girl with a simple wish and a really big heart. 
I could not begin to imagine that mother's pain. Would she rather have her daughter back? Of course. I mean, I'm sure there's nothing she would want more. But even our darkest suffering can help someone else's tomorrow. Well, let's go back to that question we asked previously. Have you ever wondered how your pain could be used to help others? Do you believe God can transform our pain and leverage it to bless others? You know, during the first three weeks of this series, we asked you to write down the stuff you're going through. And this is a, the hard stuff in our lives, our pain, our suffering. This is the stuff we're trying to get through. You know, I wanna tell you uh, one more story that's come out of this writing, and it's from someone uh, at our Romeoville campus. Her name is Deatra, and she has graciously allowed me to read a small piece of her journey. She writes, the only parts of my childhood I seem to remember are the days I was raped and molested. The sexual abuse left such an imprint on me at an early age, every thought of my younger years only brings about shame and internal condemnation. As I continue to grow, the discipline from my father became more brutal and his anger less checked. He would beat me for child appropriate behavior or punch me for not washing the dishes fast enough. It was around this time I started cutting. I craved release and the cutting offered temporary release and something I could actually control. I bear the scars of that control to this day. After a particularly violent attack, he turned and came at my brother. I jumped between and took the blow. It was about that time the enemy had my full attention and into my ear the enemy whispered, see, you're not even worthy of saving. Cutting gave way to reckless choices, which gave way to several unsuccessful suicide attempts. The irony is even those flawed attempts couldn't get me what I craved more than anything else, to be seen, to be heard, to be fought for, and to be loved. College was another trail of bad choices, sexual promiscuity, broken dreams, excessive alcohol, and even some drug use. I'd spent so much of my life faking, pretending to be okay for others, all the while silently dying on the inside. I could smile all day long and would then go home and curl up on my bathroom floor to try and shake the numbness of being something I wasn't. To let the deception fall away and the agony of living another day come fully to the surface. I'd just lie on the floor and beg God to show me mercy and just let me die. If he hated me so much that my life was now worth nothing more than suffering, grant me this one little piece of grace and let me not see tomorrow. But tomorrow's kept coming. Then one night, back on the bathroom floor, racked with anguish and the pain of simply being, I cried out from my exhaustion and honesty and truth, why God? Why aren't I ever good enough? Why couldn't my father love me? What's so wrong with me? Why do you hate me, God? Everyone who's ever supposed to love me has let me down and told me I didn't matter in some way. Why God, where are you? I screamed mockingly. Laying on the floor, in the dark, sobbing profusely, but finally fully exposed before God, I thought I heard the voice of God whisper softly to me, I love you. And it startled me. But God, there's nothing good about me. And that same voice whispered once again, but oh, my precious one, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, that was some years ago, and I'm still healing but I'm so thankful for that night on the bathroom floor when God whispered my name. Isn't that good? And now, you know, I, Dietra, uh, she's one of our leaders that celebrate the journey. She's strong enough to be weak enough, to, to allow her scars to be used to serve and help others. I see the J is better because Dietra is there, and Dietra is freer in life than ever before because she shares her story with others. So the question is, what is the painful experience in your life that you want God to use for good in someone else's life? Who do you think you can share your experience with so they can receive God's comfort? Remember the words of Rick Warren, your greatest ministry will flow out of your pain not out of your strengths or your talents, but out of the painful experiences of your life. It is your weaknesses that help other people in their need, not your strengths. Do you believe that? 
Do you believe God wants to use the darkest part of your life to change both you and the world? Let's pray and let's pray that God would use every single part of us, not just the fancy parts that are all put together nicely, but also the dark parts, the hidden parts, the shameful parts. Let's ask God to transform them for the good, for our good and for the good of others. Amen? Amen.